The airplane's ice is derived from their water supply and so the ice may get you sick. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Money's with Mover. I'm Mover, C.W. Lemoyne, author of the Spectre series and the Alex Shepard series. If you like books, please pick one of those up. It helps support the channel. Uh, also, one more week left. In fact, I think it's Thursday uh, for registration for the Folds of Honor Fight for Honor 2019 DCS tournament. The winner will get a chance to fly with me in DCS and get a module of your choosing, plus the Thrustmaster uh, F-18 HOTAS, and second place will get a flight with Gonki plus the DCS module of your choosing. Yeah, DCS flight with Gonki, not an actual flight, although that would be really cool. And then uh, third place will get the DCS module of your choosing. It does support a great cause, so even if you think you're going to lose, uh, suck with confidence, sign up, and lose with honor if that's the choice you make. However, I think you got a shot. Make them tell you no mentality will probably apply here. So, you know, win. Try to win. But uh, it, it supports a great cause. Folds of Honor is a great charity that supports uh, fallen veterans uh, and their families for educational scholarships. So today's episode, uh, we're going back to the airline thing. And you may wonder, well, can airline pilots have uh, facial hair? I think I talked about this on the Mover Mailbag, which I'm filming both of those now. So maybe, maybe not. I've got uh, work next week. But it's kind of a badge of honor for how long you've been off work. I know a lot of airline pilots do this because we're not allowed to have facial hair in the United States. I know some of the European and foreign carriers are, which the rule is kind of ridiculous. But even on the military side, I can't have facial hair. But uh, yeah, we'll just grow it just as a badge of honor of how long I've been off work. So it's been about a week for me. So this is as good as it gets. On that note, uh, someone sent me an email about uh, sending an article that I thought was kind of funny. And it's the 25 things pilots do in the cockpit they don't want passengers to know. And uh, most of it was wrong. But I thought I would talk about it and kind of go over why it's wrong and educate the public and hopefully maybe you won't be as misinformed as this author is. Although there's some stuff that's actually correct in there, uh, I want to talk about what's wrong with it and kind of some of the misperceptions about being an airline pilot. And uh, the mover mailbag, I think we had an airline uh, pilot question on that too. So oh, look, here we go. I do still fly. All right, so here we go. Let's get right to it. 25 things pilots do in the cockpit they don't want passengers to know. I don't I don't know of anything really. I got it, like off the top of my head before I read this. I don't really know of anything that I do that I don't want you to know about. Um, I mean, there's nothing really. I mean, there is a cockpit voice recorder. So if I die from being stupid, the world knows what I just did in the cockpit. So I I wouldn't advise like a young pilot to do anything in the cockpit that you wouldn't want the public to know because the public will always find out. Let's get started. Uh, it's a slideshow. Number 25, they sleep in the cockpit. Pilots don't want passengers to know they sleep up in the air and that's because it's prohibited airline regulations do not allow pilots to sleep off flying. Flight lasts 11 hours or more. No. In Europe, that actually there are, there's like napping schedules that they have, but on narrow body flying, we don't fly 11 hours or more. That's the FAR 117, which is the fatigue duty time limits, doesn't allow that for two pilot aircraft. So, um, do pilots nap? Not that I've seen. I've heard stories from others, maybe, but uh, it's not common. I don't think pilots do it as a regular thing. Uh, if, not, if Maybe it's by accident if they do. But uh, it's not, there's no 11 hour flights in narrow body flying. And then for the wide body flying, you have what's called uh, relief pilots. So every four hours they'll switch. And during those four hour times, they have actual rest facilities in the aircraft that they go up and sleep in the bunks and stuff. So they absolutely are sleeping legally in the aircraft. So this is just wrong. Number 24, their uniform commands respect. And this one, I love this one. Pilots in uniform often command respect while they're at the airport or on the plane. The uniform is so stately that they often look like stars when people at the airport stop to shake their hands or smile at them. They are also saluted and people call the pilot captain. Yeah, if you want to believe that, that's fine. However, uh, no. The uniform, I don't think is all that cool, especially the short sleeves with the tie, even though I do it too. I just think it's tacky. But th this is like a throwback from 1906. Somebody watched Catch Me If You Can and thought that was accurate because nowhere in the world have I ever seen someone salute the pilot, any, any of us, the pilot, the captain, the first officer. Now, yes, they are called captain. It is a made-up civilian term that's not an actual, it's pilot in command is the actual legal definition, but yes, 
we, it is captain and first officer, so those do exist, but no one's saluting except for when, the, uh, when you're getting pushback, when they take the pen out of the gear, it's a pen and a salute. But that is it. There's you know, no civilians are walking around saluting guys in uniform. That's just ridiculous. And funny. I, I thought that was kind of funny. All right, number 23, they don't eat the garbage served to passengers. Wrong, we eat first class meals. Uh, they are different. Uh, usually you get like the vegetarian option and whatever the other option is, but and sometimes they're the same, but that's, uh, we absolutely eat the same whatever's in first class and they are catered meals and they're just extra meals. So uh, this whole, so you can't be sick or contaminated is just stupid. Seriously dehydrated, I laughed at this one. Uh, pilots themselves, when it comes to drinking liquid, because we're strict protocols for a pilot to use the laboratory in flight, uh, they can relieve themselves as long as the flight attendant takes a pilot seat in the cockpit. Yeah, yeah, two f crew members up there, urinary tract. This is actually an old bottle I saved because I sometimes like to use these as water bottles. This is what they give us on every leg. They give us a liter of water every time, and I drink it. And if I got to pee, I'll go to the bathroom. Because you call a flight attendant, you say, hey, I got to go take a bathroom break. They will make arrangements. You go out, use the bathroom, come back in. It's not a big deal. Um, I, I don't know if <laughs> nobody's dehydrating them, so that's funny. Uh, no. They can actually talk in the cockpit. Uh, pilots never reveal whether they can talk in the cockpit. They don't want us to know because passengers might think they're having conversations all the time. Reality is they can hold off while talking below 10,000 feet. Below 10,000 feet is what's called sterile cockpit. So yeah, you're not supposed to be having conversations unrelated to the flight. However, there is no rule. There's no reason I wouldn't want you to think. I mean, what would you expect us to sit there and be doing at 35,000 feet for three hours on autopilot? Like, why would I not? Why would I care if you knew that we had normal people conversations? That's just ridiculous. We're not robots. All right, number 20. They don't want us to see the computer in the cockpit. Oh, great. I wonder what this one's for. Many pilots. Many believe that pilots don't actually fly the plane and say watch the computer do their job for. That's why pilots don't want you to see the computer in the cockpit because they have autopilot on. Autopilot is no secret. It is an automation tool. It helps make the flight safer. It gives us the ability to focus on other tasks. It gives us the ability to look out for weather on the radar. It gives us the ability to deal with other things while not physically flying the plane. My T-38 has no autopilot, and it's a higher workload to fly that, to hand fly everywhere than have an autopilot. But I don't care if you know that. Everybody knows that. I don't think anybody thinks that pilots are sitting there hand flying the airplane the whole time they're up there. If, if they are, please tell me. They use, oh, there you go, number 19, they use autopilots. I don't want you to know that we use autopilots. Um, to lessen the fear of passengers, pilots don't want you to know that in the cockpit they put the plane on autopilot within seconds of taking off. I, it's not within seconds, that's pilot preference. I know some airlines, I think foreign carriers actually have rules about when you're supposed to, but I usually fly. It varies, you know, 10,000, sometimes up to cruise. It just depends on how busy it is because the way it works in the airline is the pilot flying flies the plane. The pilot monitoring, who's the other guy, which we take turns. It's not always one or the other. It's each every other leg usually. The pilot monitoring is talking on the radio, and when the pilot flying is hand flying, the pilot monitoring is plugging things in, in the FMC, which is the computer for waypoints and stuff like that. So it actually increases his workload for me to hand fly versus if I, hand, if I put it on autopilot, then I work the FMC, do other tasks, and he just talks on the radio and monitors the flight. So it is better crew coordination for me to have it on autopilot than for me to hand fly but i don't care if you know that i mean i'm telling you it, we're on autopilot that's that's what makes uh civilian aviation and airline flying as safe as it is so no don't care they read in the cockpit pilots are permitted to read newspapers during the flight in the cockpit that's not true that's because newspapers contain many short articles the pilot won't be distracted but what pilots don't want passengers to know is that they read books and and uh novels. If any of you pilots are reading or are looking for a book to read in the cockpit, I recommend Spectre Rising and going through the whole series. I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, really, the rules state that you read company material, uh, you know, FOM, which is the flight operations manual, or any, any pertinent tech data. They really don't want you reading newspapers by regulation. Now, do guys do it? Sure. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. 
um, you know, as long as it's not distracting from the flight. That's actually a question. I remember, I think Delta has an interview question. It says, hey, what happens if you're flying along and you see the captain pull out a newspaper? What do you say? And the answer is supposed to be it's like an integrity check where you're supposed to say, well, I would tell him, sir, let's look up the FOM and read this instead and all that stuff. But uh, technically, you're not supposed to. Does it matter? No. And would we care if no? Uh, this one's kind of kind of half true. You know, like they do the it's partially true. Okay, it's partially true. The p plane may be light on gas. <laughs> um, pilots don't want you to know that this is a savings measure means there's little room for unplanned event like weather. False. That's a violation of the FARs. If any airline is doing that, it's wrong. We have uh, required alternate filing minimums. For every flight, we have to have gas to go if the weather's bad to go to our destination, plus gas to go hold and shoot an approach and all that stuff. And we also have captains that add gas, and we have dispatchers that add gas because it may not legally be required, but it's just padding. So, no, we're not light on gas. That's not a thing. Now, they're not full every time, but they don't need to be because these aircraft have a, uh, a very high range. But you know, whether they're extremely light. Now, for some are longer international flights, it could become a factor where, you know, the gas has the alternate and something changes and they need to divert without ever even going there because conditions have changed because it's a long flight. But in general, we have enough gas to go there and, and shoot the approach, assuming the weather is bad, and then go to an alternate. If the weather's good, then it might be a smaller amount of extra gas, but this is just wrong. We're not, I don't care. I don't, I'm not worried about passengers thinking we're low on gas, because that's just not true. Number 16, planes get struck by lightning all the time. That's true. I've been struck twice, uh, once in the F-16, once in the F-18. Uh, I posted that video last year. It's an interesting story. It actually incapacitated my, uh, my flight lead, because I was in a Hornet, but, um, I mean, we're not going to tell the passengers that. It's not going to put anybody in a panic. It just happens, and usually it's no big deal, uh, for especially a big airliner. It just doesn't matter. Number 15, we may not be on the airline that we paid for. Boy, that sounds like a problem. Uh, you've bought a plane ticket with a major airline like American, Delta, and JetBlue. Yeah, okay. They're regionals. So it could be Mesa doing business as American Eagle or American Airlines or whatever, or it could be uh, Republic doing business as United. In fact, when they dragged that guy off the plane, that wasn't United, that was actually Republic, so in case anybody was wondering. But I don't know that they don't want you to know that because it says it right on your ticket. So who cares? Their airplane's water source is gross. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, but this says, never order a drink with ice cubes whether the scotch on the rocks or coke with ice, the airplane's ice is derived from their water supply and so the ice may get you sick. No, it's catered. Ice comes from catering. It doesn't come from the airplane's water supply. That's not, no. So, and the water they give you when the cart goes down is actually bottles like this. So, false. Next. We can actually use our phones. Uh, it actually can interfere. The 4G LTE can interfere with GPS, but it's few and far between. Uh, that's about it. It's FAA regs. You'd have to take it up with them. I think it's an FCC thing. Something about jamming up the towers and stuff, but yeah, okay. Not all FAA rules make sense. I don't even know how to answer this. I, I mean, yeah, sometimes that's true. Um, a U.S. airway captain liked the fact that we're at 39,000 feet going 400 miles an hour in a plane that could hit turbulence in any minutes. Flight attendants can walk around, serve hot coffee, but we're on the ground, a flat piece. Okay, that doesn't make sense because on in the air, smooth air, it, it, speed is relative. You can't slam on the brakes and throw a flight attendant into the 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 wall. You know that the galley. That's this doesn't no that doesn't make any sense at all. Number 11, some pilots have medical conditions. Yeah, and uh, it says you need to pass examinations every six months. That's only if you're over 40. If you're under 40, it's every year. Uh, but over 40, so you have a first class medical. But uh, yeah, so what? There are medical conditions, there's waivers. There's waivers in the military. As long as you can perform the job and not keel over and have a problem, that I don't see the problem. Number 10, they're barely making it. Contrary to public belief, con pilots do not make the look glamorous lives. True. They're woefully underpaid. According to the CNBC, they probably make $20 an hour. This, is, this must be for regional pilots. This is not, I don't even think it's true for regionals anymore. They're paid as little as $20,000 a year on a regional 
level. Yeah. Major airlines? No. No, you're, you're talking six figures. Are we underpaid? Well, I mean, compared to inflation where the, the profession was 20 years ago, yeah. It's not, it hasn't caught back up to where it used to be, but are we underpaid you know, in the poverty level? Come on, no, that's, that's not true. Not at the major airline level. At the regional level, I think still it's changed enough that they're not at the poverty. I mean, you're still talking 60, 70, 80,000 a year. So not too terrible, but yeah, it's not great. They worry about updraft. All right, so let's see. When a plane collides, experiences turbulence, becomes bumpy. Yeah, okay. Turbulence doesn't damage the aircraft. Well, it's why pilots are more concerned about the updraft. Warm, moist air moving upwards during a thunderstorm. If it collides with the plane, it could push a plane upwards into the sky, which leads to reach altitudes that are dangerous. Stupid. This is stupid. Whoever, this is not weather. This is, no. No, we're worried about actually microbursts close to the ground, um, flying around thunderstorm. Uh, thunderstorm activity is uh, dangerous because of, oh, Jesus, hail. You've got uh, hail actually happened with that El Paso, the divert, the American Airlines flight that went into the thunderstorm, hit the hail, and, and lost their entire front windshield. Um, updraft, though, I mean, this uh, that doesn't happen. You can push a plane upwards into the, what? That doesn't even, that's not a, no, no, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about uh, severe turbulence. I'm worried about hail. I'm worried about lightning. Uh, I'm worried about icing. Uh, I, I'm worried about downdrafts, um, you know, especially when I'm close to the ground, i.e. with a microburst and stuff, but I'm not, this, no, this is just, no. Eight, how long, it, how long it really takes to get to the destination? Have you noticed while flying there are fewer delays these days? No, I have not. In fact, I think there are more. Well, that's due to the Department of Transportation vigorously manages on-time flights that you can't delay a flight anymore. Pilot wants you to know on the cockpit is what they say over the air cam. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, whatever. Number seven, they love landings. They don't want you to know that they love landings because they, oh, it's the whole autopilot thing, right? Um, I don't love landings. I don't hate landings. It's just part of the job. I mean, you know, when you fly fighters, it's the admin, it's the motherhood. So, I mean, if that's the most exciting thing you do all day, then woohoo, congratulations. But, I mean, landings are cool or not. I mean, whatever. It's just part of the job. They speak in code. According to the cheat sheet, pilots use them to avoid passengers from going into panic mode. When they say air pocket, this is a calming way to say there's turbulence. Code Bravo is when there's actual danger and don't want pilots or uh, passengers to know. And if you hear 7,500, it means plane is or will be hijacked. 7,500 is a squawk code. 7,500 squawking is uh, hijacked. 7,600 is your radio failed. And 7,700 is emergency. No one in the back, I asked one of my flight attendant buddies this, and she said uh, she's never heard of 7,500 in her life because that's not a thing. There, there's code. None of this is right. Um, don't know where this comes from. But yeah, I mean, you, you do soften stuff to the passengers. You're not going to say, hey, you know, we're about to go. Um, you know, things are about, hold on to your butts. Things are about to get nasty. Nobody's going to say that. They send secret messages via the fastener seatbelt sign. Yes, that secret message is put your seatbelt on. Sit down. Keep it on. When the sign flashes or you hear the sign ding, pilots can communicate to flight attendants messages like there's severe turbulence in the head, fuel is low, and the takeoff is imminent. Uh, severe turbulence ahead, well, they'll take the hint that there is because the seatbelt light will go from off to on, which the captain will then go, hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're about to go into some rough air or we're in some rough air. Seatbelt signs on for your safety. Please keep it fastened securely around your waist, all that stuff. And there is no chime for fuel is low. I'm not, I don't, I don't know if there is, I don't know it. And takeoff is imminent. I can't say imminent. Takeoff is imminent is a chime, and that's just per procedure. So yeah, I guess partially true, but the fasten your seatbelt line just means put your damn seatbelt on. Oxygen mask lasts only 15 minutes. I don't know why we don't want you to know that. Um, we're, we're not gonna be hanging out. If, so the masks are for if we depressurize, right? So if that happens, our procedures are to descend. So we're not gonna stay up at 30,000 feet for a prolonged period of time where this would be a factor. We're gonna to descend to a depressurization route if it applies, or we're gonna descend and land somewhere. They're exhausted, oh my God. For domestic flights, the FAA limits pilots to eight hours. 
No, I mean, yeah, I will agree that FAR 117 is not as conservative as I think it should be at some times. I think they kind of push the limits, especially when you flip from a day flight to a night flight to an early morning. Uh, and there's no real rule about that as long as you get eight hours of uninterrupted rest opportunity. Um, so I, I think it is a little bit liberal as far as what you can do, but the pilot always has the fatigue option. And that's the great thing is you, you know, if you're tired, you can go, I'm fatigued and no harm, no foul. It, if it's operationally driven, which usually if it's schedule related or hotel related, it will be, you can get paid for it. Done and done. I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, yes, schedules can be onerous and schedules can be fatiguing, but to say that we don't want you to know that we're running around tired, I mean, that's not all the case. Although I, I, I will say this one's probably, of the things on here, is probably the, the truest part, just based on some of the schedules. Number two, they downplay any problems. Uh, for example, you'll never hear folks, the visibility is out there is zero. They'll just say there's some fog and loss. And why would we? The general public gets their news and information from sites like this that obviously have no knowledge of flying and CNN that thought that MH370 went into a black hole uh, or that thinks that you know planes won't fly when they run out of gas, newsflash. But yeah, you're not going to go and try to panic people and say that, hey, we've got, we're, you know, tell them the exact problem. We've got an anti-ice problem on the left engine. I mean, it's like talk, it's like a dog watching TV. Passengers aren't mechanics. There's no reason to try to translate mechanical problems to passengers from pilots. We'll just tell you, hey, you know, we're, we got a mechanical problem. We're going here. We've got fog. Weather's bad. You know, it, there's no, re there's just no reason to do that. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we're not trying to panic people, but why would you? I mean, what, what good does it do the person in the back to know that the visibility is an eighth of a mile? It's useless info. And finally, there are secret chambers in which they can get shut eye. That's not a secret. I talked about this on like number 25. Uh, yeah, there's rest facilities. It's not a secret. You can go on Google and find it. They're nice beds. I've slept in a 777 before on a commute. It's awesome. It's great. Really good sleep. They say that's what it determines whether you're going to like wide body flying is whether you can sleep in these little rest facilities. But some of them are first class seats. Some of them are actual bunks. Some of them are real nice. Some of them are crappy. But uh, I don't know that anybody thinks that. So anyway, that is that article. I don't, I'm not trying, I know I ended up making that when I did this for the infographics thing that it, they ended up taking their video down, which I'm sorry, but uh, I just wanted to clear the air, uh, maybe do a little airline stuff because I don't talk about it much, but a lot of this stuff, I mean, it's air travel is safe by design and there's not a lot that goes on in the cockpit that you'd be like, oh Jesus, I didn't know because the pilots are professional, the pilots are well-trained and we want to get their safety. In fact, I once asked, a buddy of mine told me that he knew, um, this was back, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, um, that he had a friend that flew Air Force One and he goes, hey, how do you deal with that? I was like, what do you mean? How do you deal with what? He goes, how do you deal with knowing that you're flying the most important person in the world around, flying the president around? And he said, I don't think about it at all. He said, because I'm sitting up front too. And as long as I get there safely, there's a good chance he gets there safely. So when I'm on board, I'm the most important person on that plane. And it kind of goes, I mean, yeah, obviously we care about our passengers, but yeah, well, we're, we're self-preservation helps this a whole lot because you know we're we're trying to get ourselves safely there just as much as the pastors. So as long as we all get there safely, everybody's happy. So anyway, uh, if you haven't already, uh, there have seen it on my Facebook page, Facebook.com/slash/cwmoin. I've got a group now uh, called Make Them Tell You No, and that group is for pilot hopefuls that want advice or you know care about. Uh, becoming a professional pilot it doesn't have to be military but if you're looking for advice i would love to have the time to go through everybody's emails and answer each one individually but sometimes people are asking the same question over and over or it's just i don't have time for specific cases however i have asked some of my friends who are fighter pilots to join this group some of my friends who are professional pilots some of them are upt instructors navy instructors etc plus all the upt hopefuls i've created a group on facebook called make them tell you no and the goal is for basically you to help each other and for us to be able to help you. So please consider joining that. I'm going to start referring people to that. When you, when you message me privately, I'm going to push you to that group because I'd like, 
you know, it, for, it's one thing for me to answer it to you, but if, if others can learn from it, I think it's a good thing. And if others can ha help you, we've got people on there already that have gone through this process, that have just done the OTS pipeline or just gotten picked up through an OTS board that can help with fresh and new information. So uh, please consider joining that. And if you're too nervous or shy, you don't want you know, you're afraid of asking something because you don't want um, your information out there. Number one, it is a closed group, so no one else can see it outside of who's in the group. But number two, you can send me a message, and what I'll probably do is say, hey, please join this group, and I'll strip all your identifying information and ask your question and then get people input from the crowd. So it's it's basically group help instead of just me, you know, because some of the stuff I say might be outdated uh, or some of the stuff I say might not be, you know, completely accurate for what's going on now. So I'm trying to get in as many people I can to help pay this for it. So anyway, hope you'll consider joining that. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Like I said, please sign up for the Fight for honor 2019 that's uh ending in a couple days uh hope you guys are having a great uh, labor day holiday if that applies to you and i hope you have a great week thanks for watching and i will see you next time excuse me no oh, no oh about a lot of that Fly with the doors off. All box two. Don't be a douche. That's rule number one. Make them tell you now.